Well, good morning, Church One. Happy Labor Day. Hope, hope you are well. It's a joy to be with you this morning. And uh, thank you for that awesome time of worship, guys. And why don't you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to open up your word. Uh, I pray that you would give us the capacity to open up our minds and our hearts as well. It is not easy to be challenged. It is not easy to assess ourselves. But that is a, something that this passage is calling us to do this morning. And I want to pray for my brothers and sisters that you would open our hearts and our minds to what it is that you want us to hear. I really do pray that, Lord, that we would hear from you through the mystery of your word and your spirit. We ask this all in your name. Amen. Well, we are going to continue on in Luke. Uh, George did a great job of continuing in in our section on Luke last week and talking about humility and the characteristics of following Jesus, and a few weeks before I was talking about Jesus warning us and watching out and hypocrites, and it's really been a challenging section in the Gospel of Luke. And we come now to the section that we're in this morning, and I think one of the first things I'd like to say is as you, as you look at this passage that we're in this morning, it's fair to say that while Jesus certainly had his fair share of enemies and people that were challenged by him and didn't even like him, At the same time, Jesus also had a lot of fans. There were lots of people that were attracted to Jesus from afar. There were many people that looked at him and appreciated his compassion, his compelling teaching, his miracle ability, his his healings, and the wondrous things he did. And he drew a large, adoring crowd. But one of the things that's very interesting about Jesus is that he wasn't content with that. For most of us, I think if we had a large, adoring crowd, right, we would say, wow, like things are going great. I mean, people love me, and they love us, and isn't that awesome? And we would somehow be content with that, but Jesus was never content with that. Jesus didn't want just fans. He wanted followers. And there's a difference. And I think in this passage that we're jumping into this morning, we see Jesus laying out a challenge to his fans. He says to them, listen, I respect that you appreciate all that I do, and I'm grateful for your allegiance to me, but I want more of you. I want you to be my followers. And I want to read this passage, and I want us to just think about this transition in our own hearts, in our own minds. What does it look like for us to transition from merely fans of Jesus to genuine followers of Jesus? And so we're going to be in Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 25. This is where we're going to be. It says this, Great crowds were following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my follower, you must, love, you must love me more than your own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even more than your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple, and you cannot be my disciple if you do not carry your own cross and follow me. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first getting estimates and then checking to see if there is enough money to pay the bills? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of funds, and then how everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started the building and ran out of money before it was finished. Or what king would ever dream of going to war without first sitting down with his counselors and discussing whether his army of 10,000 is strong enough to defeat the 20,000 soldiers who are marching against him. If he is not able, then while the enemy is still far away, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace. So no one can become my disciple without giving up everything for me. 
This is Jesus' word, and what Jesus is saying is that he wants us to consider what does it mean to move from becoming a fan to a follower. And I think you can break this passage down lots of different ways, but I've chosen to look at it this way. We're going to look at three essential questions that Jesus is asking and one reason why he can ask them. The first essential question that Jesus is asking is this, is your heart in this? He says in verse 26, and I'm going to quote from the NIV now, but he says in verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yet even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, depending on how your family's going right now, some of you have been looking for this passage all of your life, right? But Jesus is is more explicit than that, right? He, He says... What he's talking about is a differentiation from your family for a purpose, for a purpose. And what he's asking is, if this isn't your most important commitment, if I am not your most important commitment, then you are not going to stick this out. This isn't doom and gloom. It's not giving you permission to actually hate your family. It's a deliberately provocative way to make your heart be challenged. In Jesus' day, your family and your culture were everything. They defined you. They, They lived the mantra, I am because we are. Jesus is saying to them, amidst that culture, he's saying, I have to be bigger than that. I have to be bigger than the thing that you define yourself as. And it's not unlike marriage or having kids today, if, 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 that, if those events do not fundamentally change your life, if they don't reorient your life, then you are missing the point. Think of it this way. When someone asks you, how are you doing? At least for me, when someone asks me that question, when I think to answer it, I don't think about just myself. I think about my family. When someone says, how are you doing? I I go through, you know, how am I doing personally? But then, you know, Ann's shoulder's been bothering her. And my dad's had some health challenges. And and when, when you say, how are you doing? I'm not just you. There's a broader calculus in my network. There's a broader identity that I have when you ask me that question. And I think what Jesus is saying is that, listen, like, I have to be that close to you. This has, your heart has to be in this so much so that your sense of yourself is tied to your relationship to me. That's what it means to really follow Jesus. Fans are fickle, aren't they? I remember... The year after the Ravens won the Super Bowl, I was watching the Ravens with Matt, and Flacco threw an interception, and Matt just said, Flacco stinks! And I'm like, wait, just wait a minute, man. Do you remember, you know, last January? But, like, fans are fickle, right? Fans are in it for what they get out of it, as long as it helps them. But followers are different because followers have made a heart commitment, So I ask you this this morning, Church One, is your heart in this? Why or why not? What are the things that kind of keep your heart from being in it? And listen, your heart's not going to get in it by feeling bad, by faking it, by me layering guilt on you. The only way your heart gets in it is to have a big enough vision. Jesus came to bring us life. Imagine just for a second a life full of love and faith and joy and peace and kindness and trust and peace. These are the things that Jesus wants you to have. He wants to give you these things, not through the circumstances of your life, but through a heart connection to Him that brings about the fruit of the Spirit that makes you into a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. In order to experience all that Jesus wants to offer you, you have to follow. You can't just be a fan. 
Because a follower fights through the confusion of the fundamental reorientation it takes. When I gave you that illustration of marriage and childhood, you know, I appreciate what Kevin um, talked about when he talked about vacation, right? Once you have little kids, it's a trip. It's not a vacation anymore, right? Like, and, and what's happening in that time is you as an individual are undergoing a fundamental reorientation in your expectations of things because you now see yourself differently. And that isn't easy. Fans do not put up with fundamental reorientations. Followers will. And Jesus wants to ask you a basic question. Is your heart in it? And if it isn't, say why. I don't know. I like to make a lot of money, and it seems, you know, I'd rather, I'm worried about work and all these other things. I, you know, like my image, my, where I am, who I, who I hang out with, are, they're more important to me, Jesus, than these things. And if that's true, look, Jesus is just asking, he's stating these things. He's not condemning anyone. I think he's simply saying, all right, then we're going to have to talk about that. If you want to follow me, We're going to have to work on that. And we're all works in progress. Which leads to question number two, which is this. Are you willing to live differently? In verse 27, Jesus says this. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Picking up your cross and following means obeying. It means going to places you would not naturally want to go. It means letting go of yourself and your needs as your primary goal in life. It means being obedient. For some, even today, that obedience leads all the way to being martyred for their faith. Let's not forget that over the 2,000 years of church history, some of these, some people, some followers of Jesus had to literally do what Jesus just said. It certainly can mean a lot of persecution and hardship for many of followers of Jesus, and that is happening right now in our world today. So Jesus wasn't just waxing philosophic when he talked about carrying the cross. He was being realistic for some. But for many of us right now, uh, through God's grace and where we are in history, that may not be our reality. But it still means a struggle at some level. Listen, there are certain crisis points in your faith where you are going to have to take the step of obedience. You cannot grow without that step. And it's going to require obedience, doing what you probably don't feel like doing. The the idea of being obedient to someone else is something that I don't know about you, but it's, it's very foreign to me. What does obedience look like for us in today's culture? Now, we could come up with a lot of different things, but I just sort of listed a few of them. This is by no means a complete list, but I thought about what is, what is picking up your cross and following Jesus in today's culture mean? Well, it means you might not be as cool, you know? I mean, if you're obnoxious or you're weird about your faith, that's on you. But I still haven't found a way, right, to follow Jesus and at the same time fit in completely with the cool crowd. I just haven't. You're going to be challenged on practical things like sex, money, power, your time. You're going to be asked to steward and wisely invest these powerful things, not just to use them on you. You may have your beliefs challenged. How many of you lately have admitted you were wrong about something? How many of you have thought something you believed or understood, now you realize, you know, I was wrong about that. You may have your belief challenged, like, like right, what, what we're doing right now. You're, you're, I hope you're listening to me. Maybe you're not, but, but you're, I hope you're listening to, to Jesus when he says, like, you, you got to pick up your cross. you got to follow me. you got to be obedient. you got to learn that sometimes you're wrong. 
You have to open up your mind. You'll be asked to serve, ask forgiveness, forgive others, be kind to people that are mean to you, give respect to parents, teachers, bosses, government leaders that you don't think deserve it. All things I guarantee you at the moment you will not feel like doing. You will be asked to serve the poor, welcome children, visit the sick, hang out with people who are different than you in every way, socially, racially, life stage. You will have to give to people who cannot have the resources to give back to you, and you will be asked to give just because. And that won't be easy. But here's what I'd like to say. You have to die to something to really live. Which Jesus, Jesus isn't asking anything new of anybody. Anybody that has lived a meaningful life has learned to die to themselves for something greater. The only issue is, what are you willing to die for and how great is the thing that you're dying for? That's the only question. Listen, how often do you say, you know what I love about that guy? Is that he just lives for himself. You know what makes that guy awesome? Is it, he's, It's all about him. Man, I love that. Whoever says that? We always know that life is in dying. The question is, what are you dying for? An addicted person is the least free person you will ever find, but also the least willing to die for them to themselves. Jesus says, your life in the end will be measured not by what you gain, but where you gave and sacrificed. We all have to pick up a cross somewhere to really live. When Jesus invites you to be obedient, he is inviting you to life, not death. Are you willing to live differently, Jesus asks. And lastly, the third question that I think Jesus is asking if he wants us to transition from fans to followers is this. Have you thought this through? Starting in verse 28, he gives two illustrations. He says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he'll send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. Both of these guys, the landowner and the king heading out for war, had to ask a basic question. Do I have the resources to do what I said I was going to do? They have to ask the question, do I have enough money to build the tower? Do I have enough soldiers to fight fight the war? Do I have the resources to do what I have to do? Jesus is asking his would-be followers the same question. He's asking them and he's asking us, do you have the spiritual resources necessary to pull this off? Can you, in your own strength, Pick up your cross and follow him. Let me answer that question for you and for me. And oh, no. You can't will your way through this. You, you, I can't talk you into it. I can't talk me into it. You cannot muster the spiritual strength to follow Jesus and to live the life he called you to. You need help. That's why Jesus says, listen, before you start this journey, it would be a really good idea if you count the cost. Because you lack the resources to pull this off. And that's why places like Church One are significant. Because we recognize that individually we do not possess the resources. We need to resource each other. We need to tap into the spiritual resources that are necessary. Our values like scripture, Sabbath, spiritual practice, spiritual friendship, service, they're all things that we value because we believe they give you what you need to follow Jesus. But one caveat. 
They are spiritual resources as long as they are connected to Jesus. If they become activities in and of themselves, just things you're doing because you're doing them, then they won't work. But if you begin to collect the resources from Jesus to follow him, you will have the strength to follow him. The most jaded people to the Christian life that I have encountered aren't the ones who are just hanging out, having a good time, blowing God off. They're the people that have tried in their own strength and energy to do what Jesus says to do. They don't find religious frustrating. They find it impossible. They thought that Jesus was just about giving them what they needed to live a good life, and they listened, and they tried it, and it didn't work. Jesus would say, I'm not sure you thought that one through. You don't have the resources. You need me to give you what you need. Well, how do we fundamentally get the resources? And that leads to my last observation. Jesus asked three challenging questions, didn't he? You know, um, like, is your heart in this? Are you willing to listen? Um, Do you have what it takes? Have you thought this through? And lastly, why can Jesus ask these questions of us? I did a wedding in, um, in North Carolina one time, and I made the mistake of ending the wedding by saying, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ and by the power invested in me by the state of North Carolina, I pronounce you husband and wife. And what I didn't realize as a Yankee was that down south, that state's rights thing is still a little prickly. And some guy came up to me at the reception and he said, what right do you have to say husband and wife? What right do you have? I'm like, I don't, you know, I, that's just what you're supposed to say at the end of weddings. Like, I don't, you know, you know, and, but it made me realize, like, it's a fair question. Like, what right do you have? What right does Jesus have to ask these kind of questions of us? Well, you, I think as you look at him, you'll see that Jesus didn't ask anything of you that he didn't already do for you. You know, Jesus had a perfect, loving relationship with his heavenly Father. He existed in eternal family, but but on the cross he cried out to his Father, and his Father didn't even answer. He, in a sense, surrendered. He gave up his family so that all of us could join God's family. Jesus quite literally picked up his cross. He endured the shame and the mocking and the suffering and the pain. He endured it all. Why? For the joy set before him. And you know what his joy was? It was you. It was each one of you. He counted the cost. He knew the calculus of our sin and guilt and the need for His righteousness to cover our sin and guilt. And He, God made Him who knew no sin to become sin on our part, so that, uh, for our part, so that we could become the righteousness of God in Him. You don't have what it takes. He understood that, but He's offering Himself to us. And that is why He can ask. And that is why I think his challenge to us this morning is this. Are you a fan or are you a follower? Kevin and the worship team is going to come up here and and we're going to close with a beautiful song that Kevin selected that I would just kind of ask you to just use as a time of reflection. Use it at his Use it as an opportunity to ask yourself these questions like, is your heart in this? Am I willing to live differently? Have I thought this all through? Jesus doesn't want more fans. He desperately needs more followers. What he wants to make is followers. Church One, may you follow Jesus this week wherever he may lead. God bless you. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next week.